Good morning. I'm Jose Carvalho from Toronto, Canada. This morning, I will be addressing the topic uh, program intermittent epidural bolus or PIEB. These are my disclosures, and this is an outline of my presentation. I'll briefly describe the mechanism of action of PIEB, how smart pumps can deliver PIEB plus PCA, the evidence supporting the use of PIEB, some basic principles of the technique and ways that one can use to optimize the technique. It is interesting to note that the PIEB technique is actually a return to the past, but in a very elegant and refined way. If we go back 40, 50 years in time, that is how we actually started. We started using bolus injection of local anesthetic into the epidural space. We moved to continuous infusion, to a combination of both. And finally, we find ourselves using two modalities of bolus injection, PIEB plus PCEA. This has been possible thanks to the introduction of the smart pumps into the market approximately 10 years ago. The previous generation of pumps would deliver a continuous infusion, CEI, and allow the patient to administer a rescue dose if required, PCEA. Whereas the new smart pumps allow us to program automated boluses, PIEB, in addition to the PCEA mode. The different delivery modes generate a very different spread of local anesthetic into the epidural space, and that explains some of the clinical differences between the different techniques. We know that effective epidural analgesia depends on a circumferential spread of the local anesthetic solution around the epidural space. And when we compare the administration of local anesthetic solutions as bolus or continuous infusion, it has been demonstrated that the area of the circumferential spread is much wider with the bolus administration and also less dense or concentrated. And this explains some clinical advantages of PIEB over continuous epidural infusion, such as better and wider analgesia and less motor block. It is also important to understand that in both modes of delivery, but particularly in the bolus mode, there is also some random asymmetric spread, which may reach much higher sensory levels. Although these high sensory block levels are not associated with complications, they might cause some concern among those being introduced to the PIB technique. I believe it is important to understand and accept that this is a feature of the PIB technique. There is uh, substantial evidence in the literature to support the advantages of PIB over continuous epidural infusion. This is one of the most re the recent meta-analysis published in 2019. It compiled 11 RCTs with a reasonable amount of patients on each arm of the study. And the results suggest that PIB plus PCA is associated with less breakthrough pain, less use of PCEA in local anesthetic, shorter duration of labor, less instrumental delivery, and improved maternal satisfaction, all of these with similar side effects. Let's move now to the optimization of the PIB technique. And for that, I would refer you to the study by Wong and co-investigators that, in my opinion, explains a fundamental aspect of the PIB technique, which is larger boluses and longer intervals between the boluses are the most effective way to use the PIB technique. They administered the same amount of bupivacaine, 0.0625% with fentanyl per hour, but in different ways, varying from very small boluses of 2.5 cc's every 15 minutes to 5 cc's every 30 minutes to 10 cc's every hour. 
and show that the larger bolus and the longer intervals are the ones associated with less consumption of local anesthetics, demonstrating the efficacy of larger boluses and longer intervals. I guess the pending question related to the PIB technique is what is the ideal PIB regimen? And the answer will vary with the local anesthetic solution that you decide to use and also with the goals that you establish for your PIB regimen. Do you want to use regimens that are effective in 50% of your patients and offer them PCA as rescue? Or do you want to work with regimens that are effective in 90% of your patients with minimal use of PCA? In our case, we have chosen to work with a technique that will maintain the local anesthetic concentration in the epidural space above the minimum effective concentration in 90% of our patients. With that, we hope that patients will experience a more sustained pattern of analgesia with minimum breakthrough pain and minimum use of PCA. This is how we design all our subsequent studies with the goal of achieving effective PIB regimens with 90% efficacy. In our first study, we sought to determine the optimal interval between boluses of 10 cc's of bupivacaine 0.06 to 5 percent with fentanyl 2 micrograms per cc. We determined that this optimal interval was approximately 40 minutes, and we adopted that regimen as our standard practice. In that study, however, a few things caught our attention. I would uh, invite you to focus on the column of 40 minutes specifically. You can see that in this small group of patients, there was no motor block and no hypotension that required treatment. But when we look at the sensory block levels, 40% of our patients developed a sensory block to ice above T6. This is an arbitrary level of block that in our institution will trigger a call to anesthesia by nursing. So it did call our attention. It is very important to highlight, however, that uh, these sensory block levels are not associated with hypotension or respiratory com compromise. This is very much in keeping with that cartoon that I showed in the beginning of my presentation. Based on this observation, we conducted a series of studies trying to make changes to our technique to see if we could optimize this sensory block. We tried to decrease the volume of the bolus initially, but it did not work well. We do need that amount of local anesthetic per bolus to produce an effective technique. We then try to reduce the volume of the bolus by increasing the concentration. And we did this in two steps. First, with bupivacaine 0.125, and then with bupivacaine 0.25. And we learned that as we increase the concentration and decrease the volume, we end up requiring shorter intervals and consequently increasing the consumption of local anesthetic, which is something that we don't want. I guess the message from all these studies is that dilute solutions with larger boluses and longer intervals are the best and most effective way to use PIEB. After several studies, we have concluded that the optimal 
PIB technique for our own setting is the one that we use in our initial study. And that is the PIB regimen that we have adopted with great success at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. 10 cc's of bupivacaine 0.0625 with fentanyl, two micrograms per cc, delivered every 40 minutes. The first bolus initiated 40 minutes after the loading dose. PCA 5 cc's, lockout 10 minutes, and maximum hourly offer of local anesthetics of 30 cc's. To conclude, this brief presentation, I would like to leave you with some uh, take home messages. First, that we started with bolus and we're back to bolus in a more refined way. Bolus is better than continuous infusion. PIB plus PCA is superior to CEI plus PCA. If you choose to use PIB, larger volumes and longer intervals are better. Please remember that PIB is associated with a wide spread of sensory block, not necessarily harmful. And last but not least, define clear goals for your technique and then work on your own ideal PIB regimen. Thank you very much for your attention this morning and I'm looking forward to the question and answer period.